First off, I want to thank the uh, brave men and women who work behind the wall. I want to thank them on a national level because their job goes on How recognized. How do they try to turn a guard? Well, prison, uh, correctional officer. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, but correctional officer. How are you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji, host of Tier Talk. Guess what, guys? Russ Hamilton has sent us another interview. So, Russ, this is your second one. You're becoming a pro. Uh, your last interview was excellent, guys. If you haven't had a chance to see it, you should check it out. He interviewed the superintendent of a juvenile detention center out in California. It's a great dialogue. It kind of actually shows a little bit of the balance between safety and security and programming. Overall, just a great interview. And for this episode, Russ Hamilton interviewed Robert Sharkey. Now, Robert Sharkey is the author of a new book on the market called Knuckle Dragger. And basically, it documents his trials, tribulations, working in the California Department of Corrections. This interview was another excellent interview. Russ, thank you again for doing this for the channel. And uh, I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. When we come back from our sponsors, I'm going to give the show over to our boy, Russ Hamilton. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University, learn from the leader. Hi everyone, I'm Russ Hamilton. I'm a retired sergeant with California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Hey there, Tier Talk fans, Russ Hamilton here. Hey, I'm visiting today with an old friend of mine, someone who also was unlucky enough to supervise me at times, uh, Rob Sharkey. Anyway, Rob Sharkey here um, had quite a long and interesting career. And one of the things that he did after his career was over is he decided that he was gonna try his hand at becoming an author. And so uh, we're posting his book up today and this is Knuckle Dragger. So anyway, Rob, I wanna thank you for giving us this time and being able to just uh, pick your mind about this book and what it means to you. And um, I just wanna make a comment about something here and then uh, let you take it away a little bit. When I see uh, Robert Sharkey's name underneath Knuckle Dragger there, I don't think of you as a Knuckle Dragger. Uh, a CRT you. operator, yes. A supervisor, yes. Someone who has writing skills par excellent, but not a Knuckle Dragger. So why did you come up with that name? Well, one of the reasons I came up with um, that as a title was because of the misperceptions and the, mis the misconceptions that they have out there at times with correctional officers. We see, especially as a correctional officer and you have a career as a correctional officer, you tend to pay attention to the news and the papers when they talk about correctional officers. And there is a, a lot of times uh, an incorrect opinion of what a correctional officer is and the job that they do. And you, you watch movies, you know, you read stories, you read books. And the, the stories that you hear about correctional officers usually isn't the, the honest view of really what goes on behind those walls. And so I like the word knuckle dragger because it's exactly what we aren't. You know, it's exactly what a correctional officer isn't. And um, I always thought of myself as more than just a knuckle dragger. I, I thought of you and, and guys like you as more than just a guy that pounded a tear and... Um, as the movies portray, somebody who beats up inmates or looks for violence or, or is prone to um, treating people as uh, less than human or whatever the, the, the false perceptions are, are out there. In fact, I had read uh, a few reports and um, students that were going through uh, their master's program and there, there are a couple of theses that are, that are written out there about correctional officers and the, and the problems that correctional officers face. And, Many of them talk about the misperceptions that the public and the news has. In fact, many law enforcement officers that work in other agencies have false perceptions about us. You know, and having the, being fortunate enough to train with some of these other agencies, it took a minute to break through that, that um, false opinion of what they may have of a correctional officer. So that's quite, kind of why I, I chose that book title because I went into the job knowing that I wanted to be more than just a guy who did unlocks and pounded a tear, you know? 
So, so as the, as the setup for this uh, starts to happen, as um, before you even get to your career, um, you talk some in here about particular uh, people who started to shape you, right. um, especially when you first talk about your military experiences and your um, with certain drill sergeants and with certain bosses that you had right off the bat. Right. As you was, as you were there in Hawaii, were you Schofield Barracks? Schofield Barracks. Yeah. Schofield Barracks. I've been there, so yeah. I know awesome know a little place. bit about that. So talk about a little bit about how that started started to shape you toward what you were eventually going to get into and eventually going to become? Well, I, I think the, the main reason some of those guys shaped me or, or impacted me was for whatever reason, I, I was drawn to leaders that, that were, uh, they held their, their subordinates or their men, and I mean men and women, uh, responsible. They held them to a higher standard and held them responsible. But at the same time, they would go to bat for their, their people. And then behind closed doors, there might be some difficult conversations or, or difficult corrections that need to be made, but you knew that they may be tough on you, but they had your back no matter what, and, and they were never going to sacrifice that that, um, that that support that they had for you. And so some, some of the guys, some of the drill sergeants I had, uh, a first sergeant that I mentioned in there, I, I will never forget them uh, because th there was always a piece of me, even when I went into corrections, that... Um, that, that uh, I appreciated in them, that they always had your back no matter what. Even when you made a mistake, if it was an honest mistake, they, they had your back. And uh, I, I never forgot that. You get to the, the end of your military career as you're, as you're done with your um, responsibilities there. And at that point, you tend to start focusing more on your education and your hobbies at the same time but you still don't have any direction, at least not a direction that's pushing you toward corrections. So talk about how that ended up helping or hurting you eventually. Well, I, I always had this thought, you know, I, I wanted to stay in the military. So leaving the military wasn't because I didn't like the military because I loved it. It was very difficult to, to leave because of the, the examples of leadership that I saw and the friends I made. But I really wanted to go to college because I wanted to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I, I always loved music. I always loved to play the guitar, and that was always my my um, my first true love. And, and uh, I really wanted to do something related to music, but common sense also told me that that I needed to have a career. But I always thought that I might do something, you know, not big, but I wanted to do something that had meaning. I wanted to do something where I could look at myself in the mirror and be proud of uh, the career I chose. And so I went to college. I majored in psychology. I enjoyed that because I enjoyed the cerebral aspect of, of uh, human functioning, you know, the, the mental processes and learning and things like that. Uh, but as we all know, when we go to school, especially after you graduate and you start considering going into postgraduate school, is that it's uh, very expensive. And um, I, I ended up putting an application for corrections uh, based on my, my father's recommendation and and I kind of talk about that in the book and one thing leads to another I get that phone call and I end up accepting the job and uh, at that point you know that that uh, opened the door for that direction in life and I took I took that path and uh, I guess never turned you know well you know it's it's really it's really, really interesting in, in the book where you start talking about that, because that's where I, I find out, even though, even though, uh, you know, we work together both as peers and with you also as my supervisor, sometimes you don't always realize some of the um, commonalities you have with people. Right. I had reached, I had reached a point in my life where I basically, I really needed a job. And it wasn't until much later that I found out how good of a fit it was going to be. But also another thing that I didn't know about you in particular that's the same for me is that my dad was a fire captain with wow. the California Department of Forestry. And at the, uh, at the end there, um, right before he passed, he was running an inmate crew out of baseline. Uh, I had no idea. Yeah, and so, yeah, it was one of those things I just went, uh, oh, I did not know I had that much in common because with Because not, not only did my dad do that, but my grandfather did that. Oh, is that right? And when yeah. my grandfather passed away, his, his best friend who ended up um, uh, marrying my, my, my grandmother, he did the same thing. So... That's crazy. Yeah, it's it, it's small. amazing. For for those unfamiliar with um, CDCR, um, they run a huge fire camp program for inmates. There's there's many thousands of inmates involved in it, 
and it's one of the ways that uh, California saves a lot of money on the fires uh, that it does. But moving forward from here on that, so you get the, you get your acceptance, right? And and I mean, what what are you thinking now? Are you are you thinking this is this is the career for me? Well, it's, or are you or are you more along the lines of I'm going to try this out? It's funny that you say you know the the common experience that we had. Uh, going into the job because after writing this book and there's people that I've known throughout my career people I've spent a lot of time with uh, chewed a lot of dirt with that um, I, I recently spoke to one and he was he was to, to me that the best instructor I've ever had and a very dear friend of mine who, who um, still works with the department still in the crisis response team program and I was asking him I said we we're talking about the book and I said well when you went in the department did you want to and he said hell no it was only a temporary I was a Marine. I wanted to go into the Marines and things didn't pan out and becoming an officer in, in Marine Corps. So I applied for corrections because he had family that worked for corrections. And next thing you know, I mean, he's one of the most respected instructors, if not the most respected instructor that in the state that we know of. And uh, you would think as good of an instructor and employee that he is, that his whole life he thought about going into corrections. But as we find out, many of us... Uh, we just kind of took that avenue as a last step. And I remember in college that uh, I was having trouble figuring out what I was going to do and graduation was pending. And uh, friends of mine, we would all gather to barbecue at his house and watch Giants games on TV. And so one day we're sitting out there by a bar uh, at the barbecue and I was just in a dilemma and, and feeling the pressure. What am I going to do with my life? You know, I thought I'd figure things out by now. What? And he said, you know, you're thinking too much. He said, I'm going to tell you something that my dad once told me, and it's that your major decisions in life, you don't have time to think them over. Because if you have time to think it over, you're probably just going to change your mind. So the biggest decisions you will make in your life are decisions you got to make like right now. And I think about those things, just like corrections. I get that letter in the mail, and I'm like, oh, I forgot I even applied for this thing. So I'll make a phone call. And my yes comes out of my mouth before no would come out of my mouth. And so I... I but the, the crazy thing is, I felt a sense of relief because who really would want to go to work for corrections? And that was part of the reason I want to write the book, too, is that who would purposely go put themselves in prison? You know, uh, it's not a place that you're supposed to want to be in, you know. So who what kind of what kind of individual would actually take a career in, in that field? And I think a lot of people consider all the bad things that could happen in prison and you still take it left foot right foot and move your way through the gate and you're there every day you know so um i was actually excited once once i got accepted once i said yes and i knew that that was my a path uh i was all in and i was excited for everything everything that was i was excited for the academy i was excited to become a correctional officer i was excited at the possibility of taking a difficult job and maybe making the best of it and um i remember being very Troubled with that decision and my girlfriend at the time said I was like I want to be a correctional officer. I don't want to be a correctional officer. I'm a musician I'm majoring in psychology. I'm a dork. I'm not a I'm not a prison guard And she said who says you have to be a prison guard and I said well You know, I'm gonna be she said why can't you just go into that job and be Rob Sharkey and not be like somebody you think you have to be and that really um, affected me and if there's any you know that's the advice that I would give my, my child when they face their paths in life is don't do what you think you have to do. Be you, you know? So that's why I was excited to go into that job and maybe do it in my way, you know, with my personality and not have to be like someone else, you know? So next thing I know, I went to the academy and man, I, I, I loved it. I loved, I don't know if it's possible to love every minute of it, but it had to be really close because I enjoyed it from minute one all the way through. I mean, there, there's a lot of good things to be said about, you know, the academy. The academy gives you the foundation for what the rest of your career can be, right. you know. And a lot of people, you know, might look at it in a negative light and that you're being told what to do and stuff. But if you use it to build a foundation, um, you know, later on in your career, it can really bolster your abilities and it can bolster your contacts and it can bolster um, the rest of everything that you see coming in your career.
Right. And uh, corrections is an, is an amazing career because it gives a person um, at that first mine entrance, you know, that first uh, correctional officer title that you get. Right. It gives you a chance to lateral into a lot of different things from from counselor. Um, you can climb the climb the ladder like uh, like you did, eventually becoming a lieutenant. Or you can segue into other things that are available, you know, like investigations or uh, being a CRT operator. Absolutely. So Very why don't you start uh, talking about, you know, the, the transition between, um, between uh, officer and then eventually applying uh, to be an operator? Well, I think one of the things I love most about the, even the academy, or when I first went into the career, was the, the friendships that you make. And, um, you know, you rely on each other because you're so far outnumbered. And you, and you kind of got a sense of that when you went to the academy, that it's, it's, it's in a sense, you against you guys, your, your group against everybody else. And, um, I mean, you've you got to protect each other. So you already are, are taught that at the academy that, you know, you're going to go into an environment that's very difficult, and you're going to have to rely on each other. And... Um, you have to, so you got to go into this business and, and there's a great quote that I love that in the process of, of fighting monsters, it's important to not become a monster yourself. And we know in prison, there are a lot of, there, there are some bad people in there. And so when you're, when you go into that job and you're with your partners and you're, and you're on the same team, um, it's really important to do that and uh, deal with this difficult situation without becoming a, a worse person because of the, the difficulties that you face. So I love that. I love, I love with the partners and the friendships I made and how close we were even at the academy. And then when, we went to, when I went to the prison, I, I'll be honest, when I first showed up there, I, I started to hate the job. I mean, I, the first year, I was ready to, to call it a career and go some, do something else because, you know, when you're new, and I was what they call a, a, a pie, a, Permanent intermittent, permanent employee. intermittent employee, and I was, was there working. myself for a while. Yes, and it was it was tough because I wanted to belong to something, and I got that from the army, and I got that from from playing sports. I wanted to be part of a team. I wanted to matter. I wanted to do something I could be proud of and be part of something so that we could we could do good things. And when you're a pie, a permanent intermittent employee, you can never feel invested in in that program because you're here, you're there, you're filling in, you're overtime avoidance, you're getting hired for one shift, and in the process of that. And then having to stay by my phone, I lost contact with all my college buddies. And it just became a fairly almost depressing time for me because I'm like, okay, I took this job. I gave up on following my, my dreams of maybe playing music or doing something that I, and I'm doing this and I'm not getting any reward out of the job because I can't feel invested in the job because I don't have a, I don't even have a regular job to show up to every day. I don't even know where I'm going to work. And it, and it was tough to deal with. And then of course, you know, being the new guy and filling in, you're dealing with some of the the, um, the older guys, and most of them were very helpful, uh, and and some of them weren't, and uh, some of them were very, you know, I would have to say, I don't know, 90, 95% of the people that are just good, honest people working there, but, you know, it's the one or two that can make your, make your job a little difficult when you're especially the new guy, and... You know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I liked having a job. You know, I liked making at least enough money where I could, I could uh, have my car repaired, and you know, I could think about maybe someday owning a home, or you know, I could pay the rent. I, you know, after getting through college, it was nice to have a job, benefits, and and uh, uh, maybe a, a retirement down the road. But uh, the day to day job, I wasn't necessarily a fan of because. I, I didn't feel invested in, in, a, in, in a team atmosphere because I was bouncing around so much. So one day I happened to see a, a flyer for the negotiations management team, which is, you know, the, the, they call NMT. And they were our hostage negotiators, so that's what they trained to do. So I thought, I'll, I'll put in for that. So I, I put in an application for it, sent an application. And even though I only had about a year in the department, uh, I didn't have much time, so I didn't think that they were going to pick me. But you know, I had a college degree. Um, I worked, and you know, I had some work experience in dealing with um, like in group homes and things like that. So uh, maybe resolving conflict, um, it was something maybe I had some experience in. So they, they selected me on the team, and that and that basically changed my career because I felt like I finally I belonged to something that 
that had a positive twist to it. And we were, we were working to, to, to resolve issues through negotiations and talking. And, and these guys, these people on this team, they just believed in what they did. And we were going to all these other trainings and we belonged to the California Association of Hostage Negotiators. So we we're going to these trainings with these other agencies and, and you felt this, this connection with these other agencies and you felt like you were doing something good. And I was even using that at work. Um, and so I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the cerebral aspect of creating a win-win situation, you know, even in difficult situations. But during that process, I got to see the tactical team, which they called CERT, the Special Emergency Response Team, because when we do a large scale incident, uh, these guys would be there. And they were wearing what you would think of, it looks like military clothing, camouflage and tack vests and their radio mics and their, their M4s or back then more um, AR-15 style weapons. And, uh, and I thought, wow, that's, I really miss the army because I miss doing that stuff. And they were in formation and I was looking at them and I thought, I, I just feel like that's where I belong because um, I, I miss that. So, but I, I waited until they had a tryout and, and uh, I went and saw the, the team commander and got an application and, you know, it, from, from that point forward, I mean, that's where I went. I remember talking to the commander and he was a guy that, that, uh, you know, we all know it was Petri at the time. And, um, he was, I have to say he's my favorite commander that I ever had because he was just to the point, you know, and he had your back no matter what. And he was never trying to impress anybody. And that was another thing I learned. He was never trying to impress administration or somebody else. He, he was, his main principle that he followed was to do the right thing and, and to protect his, his guys. And he was, when he spoke, he was one of those guys that had a voice that was not aggressive, but just matter of fact. And so when I went to talk to him as this new guy, I mean, who am I? This skinny new guy. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm interested in trying out for the team. So he wants, he wanted to talk to me. And I thought, no, I, I don't want to talk. I want to show you that, that I want to show you that I'm all in. And uh, as nice as he was to want to talk to me about certain, I was like, I, I already know I want to do this. And uh, next thing you know, tryouts was scheduled. And, and um, it was another career changer because I, you know, Finding purpose in your job is very important you know, to me. Right. There's two key parts to uh, getting through that process. The first of which is your tryouts, and the second of which is your academy for that. All right. So let's 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 dive into that because you've got you've got you got the tryouts coming out, and uh, you probably felt pretty confident in that because of what you've done in the army, right? Yeah, I, I was fairly confident that I could get through it, but it, it was surprising how difficult it was. Uh, I mean, it it surprised me. Uh, in fact, there, there were aspects of it that were actually harder than military. And I was in the Army, infantry. Um, it did, things were very physically difficult, but so tryouts surprised me um, because they, the one purpose, as it seemed, was to see if you would quit, you know, if, if you were going to quit on your partners, if you can get through the tryout process and survive to the end and still not quit you know that that's the that was kind of how it was done back then and um, so I, I didn't think I'd have a problem getting through it uh, so I was fairly confident but like I said I, I was I was fairly surprised at how how um, sore I was afterwards <laughs> but uh now that you said to go into the, yeah, the, to the, the academy, yeah, di diving into that because that that's a different aspect. Proving that you, proving that you have the physical acumen yeah. to to carry on through that, but then uh, actually to you know earn that first uh, operator certificate. Right. And... Well, I think it's it's important to note that that tryouts. It, you know, years past. That's that's how it was. Get through it. Show you're a good partner. Show you're not going to quit on your on your partners. And show that you have heart. That was the main thing was testing your heart. Well, a lot of that evolved. Um, it, and, and it should have evolved. It, it was necessary to evolve because there's a lot more to it than just seeing if somebody won't quit. Because you can make somebody quit. You know, you can, you can do enough to somebody. If you're not calculated on how you're testing them, you can, you can cause people to either quit or they're going to get hurt. Something's going to break. Right. And that was a problem with that old school way of doing mm -hmm. things is people got broke. Um, they, they bone, something gave way because you're so tired and you, you don't want to give up on your partner that we're not going to quit on each other. And like, you know, we're not going to quit on each other. Something's going to give. 
And so you have to have a smarter way to train and that eventually started to evolve. And when I went to the CERT Academy, we heard horror stories about what was gonna happen when we showed up. And we heard from the old, the guys that went through the older academy, so I was thinking, it's gonna be on when we show up. Uh, it's, it's gonna be on and cracking. Better have your game face on and be prepared to, to, um, to get through some difficult stuff. Well, when we showed up, it wasn't really like that. They actually were trying to teach us stuff. And they weren't having us run around and, and you know, there was a, certainly an aspect of not quitting to see if you can take it, but they, they had too much stuff to teach you than to have you do stupid stuff and run around and get hurt. There was too much stuff and, and SWAT to learn, tactics and room entry skills and shooting skills and, and um, weapons handling uh, skills and uh, whether you're dealing with the inner perimeter, outer perimeter functions, there's a lot to learn. So there's, not, there's no time to be just beating on people. So it was not what I expected when we got there. Uh, we, had, we were learning room entry techniques and how to do hostage rescue and every different, whether it was on a bus or in a building or in a room or outside or, or a vehicle. Uh, that's what we spent our time doing. And, and uh, you know, the people that didn't make it got hurt just from the, the grind of it. You know, an ankle gave way or somebody fell. So it, it, we, they were slowly starting to evolve away from the days of just seeing if you could take it, you know, because that, I don't, you know, I think it was smart to realize that's not a fair test to see if people just can, can take it. So a lot of that evolved, especially as tactics in the SWAT world started to change rapidly, you know, daily, weekly, every incident, every, every SWAT call, call out that happened out in the world, uh, the SWAT community learned something else and they had to add that to their playbook and add that to their training regimen to say, okay, we, we really need to be smart about how we're, how we're dealing with situations. So the, that's about the time I went to the old CERT Academy, it was really starting to change. And um, we, we learned a lot, you know. So, so you've got the, uh, the old school, the new school right. coming at you. Um, then you're uh, bringing that back to the institution and uh, starting to uh, apply those skills in, in any number of things. I, I, I remember over the years um, seeing um, you cert guys, you know, come on the, um, you know, come on the yards many times to help us out when we had more than we could handle. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking, you know, 100 man riots, 200 man riots, 300 man riots. And onwards and, and upwards in some in some very very hairy situations. Right. So just talk about that a little bit, and then moving from that on into into uh, into uh, becoming a trainer and um, and becoming uh, you know the commander of. Uh... Well, if you remember some of those incidents, we had to bring multiple buses right on the yard because there were so many inmates involved. And and you and I know you remember it. It's one thing we have a couple inmates fighting. But when you have a dorm of 36 inmates, well, and then and then the dorm next to it, and the dorm next to it, you know, you, you just don't have the resources at in the prison to deal with that. So you, you have to bring people in, and that was one of the things that we we prided ourselves in was coming in with the with the equipment to be able to to deal with that, and maybe the experience and the and I don't know the attitude to to go in and say, okay, we're, it's, it's time to end this, and. So going out on the yard, that, especially as a, as a newer officer and being activated to come in and help people out at work was, it, it was very important to us. It was extremely important to me because you felt like you were doing something to, 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 to help. You were, you were doing something for, you, you, were, you were putting to use the things that you've been training for so much. And uh, you love that opportunity to come in and, and use those skills. And so the, the times that we were activated to come in to deal with these riots, um, we, we were very proud to do that. I was given an opportunity to teach a class around that time period, and it was emergency operations. Uh, some would say one of the more boring classes that, that we have in emergency operations is you, you have a prison, you have, you have an emergency, and Who's going to be doing what? Who's being called in? Who's going to, and, and the lesson plan that I don't know who put it together, somebody in headquarters or somewhere put it together and, and it just wasn't, 
it went, it went into to details on who does what, but it was just like a lot of lesson plans in CDC and most of them, if not all of them at that time, they were very boring. I mean, with, with no disrespect of the people that put them together, they were, they were just boring. You know, there was no substance to, there was, it was death, so death by PowerPoint. Right. Well, and, and not good PowerPoints. You know, yeah, not, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Right. Uh, so when I had a chance to teach that first class, I gave it everything, man. I was like, I put everything into that first class and I noticed that I, I got a lot of feedback and I, and I realized I might have a knack for teaching because I have this weird way of seeing things I, or I have this way of making sense of things. And sometimes I don't know if it's entertaining or I got a lot of positive feedback from it. And so I realized maybe I have a knack for teaching for whatever reason. And one class led to another and I realized I saw a lot of instructors that, that their, their methods didn't do much for me. You know, the, 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 it's easy. Anybody can step in front of a class and, and get attention by telling a joke or showing a video or, you know, but it, the harder thing is to take a correctional officer one-on-one class and actually have a class of what, 30 people. Your well, correctional officers are easy to teach things to, man. If they're, they're, they're always paying attention, and <laughs> and they never have a better way. Never have a better way, right? <laughs> and they're a better way, and they're never tired of things changing constantly. You told us how to do it. That's, what is this? Who thought of this? Yeah, stuff? Right. this is memo number ninety nine, right? Um, so whatever. If, if you have a, a a way to do it in your own voice and style, usually I think uh, the class is is receptive to that. And so for whatever reason, I I, I I was a decent instructor and I, and I had a way of, of presenting material maybe that people understood. And you know, as things happen, you get put in supervisory roles that you, you don't necessarily even ask for it. It just kind of happens. And as I became a sergeant and even a lieutenant, as, as these things happen and I, and I was put into roles to, to maybe do some classes and some training and I was sent to, to these to different courses, uh, I it really, I really took to those things and, and I, and I was very serious about trying to make a difference, you know, mm -hmm. um, because I saw the instructors that were making a difference. And I, when I saw them making a difference in me, I thought, man, that I want to do that for other people because I had so much respect for those good instructors that made you, or those, those guys that made you want to do better and believe in your job, especially as a correctional officer, because we had a lot of, it, no, nobody, nobody grows up wanting to be a correctional officer. Nobody says, hey, when I grow up, my, I have four kids. Not one of them ever says, dad, I want to I want to be a, a, a correctional officer when I grow up. Nobody says that. Be why? Because it's not a great environment. It's a negative environment. Nobody, is, nobody writes books about it or movies that actually depict on really what it is like to be, to do that job. Nothing true to life and nothing flattering. Nothing flattering. Or perhaps nothing even honest. Nothing honest. Or to show the honest, honorable work that correctional officers do and and the intelligent people that we work with and the they don't get portrayed you know and so um so when i looked at those those instructors that were making a difference and that the main you just want to drive to do better i thought i, I want to do that i want to try and when you do that when you try to do that not everybody is supportive or open to that especially being a new guy a new I was still very new, and here I am trying to teach these OGs a thing or two about being a correctional officer. Who am I? These guys, some of these guys have been doing it for 20 years, and this new guy is going to step up in front of class and tell them a better way to deal with a, a fight or a riot. It was very difficult. Where some were very daunting. positive, daunting. daunting, no doubt. And and I remember when I first started getting getting into this, how to deal with riots and and, um, and fights that involve more than just one or two individuals. I. I wanted to bring back the stuff that other people from these other institutions were teaching me. I wanted to bring back to, to our prison. And there were times, and one time in particular, I, I was coming in on my day off. I put on my uniform and I brought a lap, I, I checked out a laptop from the, from the information systems people and I got an overhead projector from them. And so I actually came to work and uh, well, most people don't know this. And I said, hey, I, I went to the sergeant. So I went right on the yard because I'm wearing my uniform and said, hey, um, I'm supposed to do some training today. Can, can you call a meeting? And most sergeants were supportive. They're like, hey, sure, Sharky. We'll do, I'll call a meeting and uh, we'll do a training. So 
I show all these riot videos because I had them all saved up, put on, put on the on the thing, and right. And 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 most of them, as you know, we did wrong. We did things unsafe, diving into the middle, and and so I was trying to show there's a better way to do this, and this better way is something they call alarm response, and it's it's a better way to deal with these riots and this mass amount of inmates that are fighting each other. We have a better way, and some people were supportive, and some people were like, "You are crazy." I mean, it, not, it wasn't my idea. I was just taking what they were, other people were teaching and trying to share it. And people were very resistant to that because they thought, no, if we don't go in there and stomp it and tackle the people involved, if we don't, then it's going to grow. The, yeah. It's going to grow. The, it'll grow so big that towers will collapse. The sky will, well, will you know, grow out, you know, and the earth will stop spinning if we don't stomp it right there. It's, it's just so funny that you say something like that because... Um, the people on my on my own website, Keepers of Chaos, and those on and those on Tier Top, will always know that you know I'm always talking about uh, the the dreaded sentence. Well, we've been doing it that way, right? And whatever, and I and I always tell I always tell these people, no, it's not what it's not that we've been doing it that way. It's that say we need to evolve or die, right? And that's that's what it is in corrections. We right. we need, need to evolve. Because we've been doing something in some way, there's no reason to continue doing it when it's when it, there's either a better way or that way is so flawed that we shouldn't keep it up. Right. So. Right. And and we both know of many people that had to retire due to injuries from jumping in the middle of something that they didn't necessarily need to jump. It's one thing if you're protecting your partner, or it's one thing if there's somebody's life is if you know there's certain situations where there's certain ways to intervene, but. When you have 150 inmates out there in mass, in chaos, running into the middle, it was something that we did. And at, it was, at one time, it, right. it, it, it was. And if you didn't do it, you were. It was. You didn't look. You didn't, you look, didn't, good. You didn't look good. No. You know, and I, you know, I'll be. I'll be first to say. You know, my uh, my career was was an evolution. You know, we, right. we started out that way. When, when, even even when I was at, when I was at San Quentin, it was the dog piles were what got people hurt. Right. And then, and then eventually, you know, when we started to come around, we first started, you know, getting, you know, alarm response and disturbance control and all of that stuff. Pepper spray. Yeah, pep, pepper spray was, was huge. Because, you know, I, that's one thing I, I talk about a lot. Good. And, and what I do is, is just the, the equipment we have. And some people are resistant to that. There are people that are resistant to, um, that are resistant to, to pepper spray, there are people that are resistant to vest, resistant to having a baton, resistant. But if we don't, if we don't evolve, we don't deserve the extra pay or the extra status. Um, in California, we're lucky we have the status we do. Right. We have we have peace officer status. Right. So that's just you know part and parcel of um, of this whole crazy line of work that that we've been in, and all these crazy situations that um, you and I have dealt with. And, right in different situations right so and and that had to evolve because too many people were getting hurt uh too many people were getting hurt and there had to be a, a safer way to deal with this violence because our job is to deal with that violence. you know our, your job is to 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 mitigate that to stop it to, to deal with it and there had to be a smarter way and luckily there were smarter people out there especially guys that worked at some of these very dangerous you know, whether it was Pelican Bay State Prison, Salinas Valley State Prison, High Desert State Prison, some of the more uh, violent uh, pr prisons that we had, they were finding better ways to deal with this. And even though we were all taught, especially in state, uh, for the Special Emergency Response Team, we were taught IRF tactics, Incident Response Force tactics. And they were based on crowd control tactics that maybe a lot of agencies on the street would use to control crowds for, for these riots and demonstrations and things. And, and we found that those were good ideas because at least gave us something. It gave us a, a plan. It gave us something. It was hard to deal with the dynamics of a prison riot using these, these crowd control tactics that might work on the street. And thankfully, there were some people that were smart enough to realize to take those tactics, to take those tactics that they were using on the street with the riots that march and sealing things off and and turns and these movements and they found a more dynamic way to deal with a more dynamic situation over these riots and it was a safer way to deal with it so this irf this incident response force ended up evolving into what they called alarm response in california and it was 
when you think about a major change like that, and you're changing the way people did it, because the old G way of doing it was you jump in there and you show your partners you're not afraid and you show the inmates you're not afraid and you get in the middle, even if it means getting hurt because it's kind of a badge of honor to get out there and, and mix it up and, and help stop it. Exactly. So it was very hard for me, especially this young dude who doesn't have many years in the department to be trying to promote this system to people when they're, they're not, they're used to doing this old way because they think that you're telling them to, to not do anything when really you're telling them let's get resources and let's deal with it effectively rather than just getting hurt. And that's what alarm response was. Uh, that's what it was all about. And I became a trainer for that and I became what they called a master trainer. And um, I was just immersed in it. I, I just believed in it so much because, and I was learning so much from these guys from these other institutions. And, and no matter if you were at Sierra Conservation Center, High Desert State Prison, Pelican Bay State Prison, Salinas Valley State Prison, or any prison from the, from the northern coast, to the northern border to Mexican border to Nevada border to the ocean, every prison needed it, right? Every prison needed it. And uh, just for those of you so, so um, we're on the, on the same page about this, this was the stuff that um, instructors like Sharky here brought back to us. And this was taught to the masses. This was, this was not something that was only for um, CERT. Right. It, it, was, it was not that. And, and um, part of that, I, I think eventually later on, really um, kind of made um, CERT probably activated less often because we brought that back and, um, you know, I know as a sergeant, you know, I went out there and, and was taught all this, you know, when I did, when I did my sergeant's academy right. and stuff, had instructors like Bishop, I know. Oh, absolutely. Ab yeah. Absolutely. And that's what we were taught. And so we brought this back or he brought this back to our prison and put it out to us. We went through the, through the training at Sacramento and this was something that we implemented on, on every yard and we were able to, you know, put down riots many, many times with more well-trained personnel and people for the most part not getting hurt. And I mean, even inmates, we saved lots of inmates. Absolutely. Lots of inmates. And if you think about it, what, what would, how many correctional officers in the state did we have at that time? I mean, what? 30,000. 30, so if you think when you do a major change like that, that involves a lot of training because this is a significant change. You, we had to, we had to basically train 30,000 officers to do it a new way. 30,000 officers do it a new way, plus add it to the academy, plus get the, the supervisors on board. That was quite an undertaking, and it took, it took us a good 10 years to finally to where the, where the effect, uh, where it became more natural to respond and do things a certain way rather than jumping in the middle. And, and you're right, that was, that was a tactic that was no longer a tactic for SWAT guys or, or the CERT guys. It was, it was a tactic for officers to use uh, to, to quell you know, you're, you're outnumbered by hundreds to hundreds one. Hundreds to one, right. Hundreds to one. And that you're going to stop them from fighting? How, how are you going to do that? Well, by, by using this alarm response. So even that uh, continued to evolve through the years, but it just made such a major change because now people had a way to, to deal with this rather than jumping in the middle. And so, yeah, honestly, in my career, there, there's some things that I'm very proud of. I was extremely proud to be part of that even though it was very difficult to, to, to try to promote a change with some, with some people at the prison, it was um, such a positive thing because we were finally doing something for us, not yeah. doing something for the inmates. You know, we are finally doing some training that we had to put some hours in that was for us and not, not for the, the inmates' benefit. It was truly for us. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's, it's interesting that you, that you bring up, you know, that that's something that, that you take pride in and stuff. Because, like, when I, when I look at the name, Robert Sharkey, when I think about Robert Sharkey, I mean, there's a couple different, I, I think of you, you know, playing a guitar, because I've, I've seen you do that before. Right. Um, but just, uh, you know, there at the uh, institution and stuff, I think of you as the operator, but then I was, yeah, that guy was, you know, teaching us all of the, uh, you know, response to these riots and stuff. And we used it a lot. I mean, it wasn't, there wasn't something that we learned and then put down and never had to think about again. It was something that, that we used. And sometimes in doing that, I, I was the bad guy. I mean, because people sometimes misperceived what I was doing. Because when there was a riot or something happening on the yard, I would go out there, especially when I worked even in the training department. I would hustle out there because I wanted to get pictures. And even though if I took pictures of people doing stuff wrong, I would black out. And I wouldn't like 
front people off. Or, but, and I wouldn't say this is wrong. I would say, okay, this is how we're doing it. Now let's try it. Like, so I would hustle out there to see how people were responding, especially to a dorm riot where inmates are in the dorm fighting and there's a better way to deal with that than to run in there, right? Uh, there was a alarm response, a, a tactical way to deal with that. And at times, you know, being the, the guy there at Sierra who did the did the, the, the alarm response training, if something went wrong, sometimes the, the, the administration would kind of look at me like, okay, we need to fix that. So how, how do you fix it when we have, what, 500 officers, if you can include the sergeants and lieutenants? How do you get to 500 people and tell them, okay, we, we, this is what happened and we can't do that no more and we have to do this. How do you do that? How do you get to everybody, especially if there, there's no overtime and you got to tell everybody, you got to get the word out there and then somebody's hearing it from somebody else is hearing it from somebody else. By, the, by that time, people think you're doing it for yourself or you're doing it to be heard when really you just, you want officers to be safer. What, so it was difficult. What does Sharky know anyway? What does he yeah, know? What does Sharky he thinks know? He's, or they say, uh, you, or I remember teaching a class and, and I don't think I'm tough. I'm not tough. And I'm teaching a class and somebody would say something like, oh yeah, you're tougher than the rest. I'm like, no, I, I, it's not about me. I'm, there's, a, there's a better way yeah. to deal with this. So when you're that person, and I'm telling you, there's correctional officers out there, there's people out there that are, that are in that situation, not just correctional officers, but anywhere where you're, you're, you're responsible to try to make a difference. And maybe you got the ability to do that. You have the voice to do that. You have the, the platform to do it. And there's a lot of things out there that will deter you or try to slow you down. But you, you, have, to, you have to keep trying to make a difference because there's more people that support you than you realize. They just didn't say anything. Yeah. So, you know, until later there's on. The, there's the, there's the, vocal, the vocal few. And, you know, some, in your career, especially, especially if you have a career where, where you, you try to do something along right. the way and achieve something, you know, the, the, resistance is, the resistance is not as stiff as you would believe it to be. It's just that the, it's just the support that you're getting behind you is less vocal. Right. So. And, you know, from being a supervisor. Yeah. When you're a supervisor, even if they like you or like you or don't like you, but probably 80% of them, 80% of them will think, yeah, smart guy, he's kind of on board. 10% are going to think you're crazy. And then 10% are going to like, I don't, you know, so you, you can't please everybody when you're trying to make a difference. Well, there's, there's, the, there's that one, one of those 10% is just like, hey, let's just see what he's going to do today if we do this. Right. <laughs> but the thing is, when you try and you do impact one, all it, for me, all it took was if I could just impact one person. And it's not me. I didn't invent it. I didn't come up with alarm response or these things. I'm just, I'm taking what these awesome instructors gave me and I'm like, I want to do good. If you just change one person, help one person, when you find out that you did, it is worth everything else, you know, because um, it, it's worth it even to just help one person, you know? And uh, so, yeah, that, that's why I was, I was very proud of. And then eventually we had more people on board that were teaching and, and the word got out and supervisors like you that were out there saying, hey, there's, this is how we're going to do it. Having meetings with your staff, very important. Even if it's five minutes to say, okay, there's a little bit of tension between this group and this group, remember, you know, we might already have a pre-established, you know, staging area, you know, we might, and, and you talk about those things to plant that seed in their brain and uh, somebody has got to do that. You know, oh, yeah. you were the type to do that. There, somebody has got to do and, that. You know, it's, it's amazing when, when it's amazing when staff uh, props you up in those circumstances, or maybe even though you should have been a little more on board, um, and they've taken, they've taken things to heart and they really surprised the heck out of me. You know, right at the end of my career there, we had, we had a very serious incident down there in G dorm with, uh, I think there's four bulldogs in there that got rushed by, I think 27, um, Sereños. Right. And, and my staff just, man, I don't even know why I was there. They handled, I was, I was there to, I was there to say, yeah, you guys should, should investigate me because I planned this or that's what the, that's what the charge was. Right. But my, but my staff handled it so well. And then they went in there and, uh, and cleaned everything up in the investigation too and said, no, that was, that was, that happened the way it happened. And they got in there and I mean, every one of them, you know, just right down to the T, they identified people, put people in handcuffs, got them cleared. And it was amazing to see, you know, well, maybe I had a tiny bit to do with that. But mostly, you know, it was their it was their own effort to get them to that particular 
Well, and you also got that because you didn't micromanage them. You know, you the, the, they knew, their, and you trusted right. they knew their job. And that's sometimes a hard thing for, for supervisors and for people to do is to let people do their job. If they're doing the right thing, sometimes just sitting back and letting them go is... Um, is much more effective than oh, you know. It, it, it is, and you got to you know you can't you can't internalize it and, and just have your your stomach in knots because then you'll try and be you'll try and be everywhere and then you're then you're not going to be effective. Right. If you have if you have to be everywhere, you can't be effective. Let your let your staff go. Right, right, and you also have to accept that some there's something is going to go wrong. I mean, something is going to need to be covered in the in your after action report that something there's something that could. Something Murphy is going to bite you, and if you're, and you shouldn't fear that. You know? No, because that because that gives that gives you a chance to shine the next time. Right. You know, uh, so, you know, challenges are opportunities, and opportunities are chances to shine. You know, and oh. you, you know, if you if you don't look at it that way, you'll eat yourself alive. Because this this profession will do that to you from one ans aspect or another. If it's not from the inmates. It'll be from administration. If it's not right. from administration, it's from your peers. Right. And there's there's a point that you talk about in the in a book about um, about going out and not being in um, in service training anymore that was caused by a peer. And, I agree. Yeah. And right. and so say 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 a little bit about that when when it's well time to, when it's time to let go of that and then as it's and then as it's time to let go of. Uh, of the job itself. Well, I, I was given an opportunity to run the training department and uh, it was just a wonderful opportunity for me because it felt like everything in my career, I mean, everything in my life kind of led to that point where I was able to, you know, I had, I had some experience uh, of things where there were tactics or, or te experience in teaching people, experience in, in getting a subject across to people. So when I was given an opportunity to run the training department, um, I jumped in with both both feet, as as many people there saw, and um, I I was I wanted to make such a difference. I wanted to change how training was done there because I didn't like how or, or because we get a week of uh, formal training in a classroom. All officers have to go through it, and I didn't like my week of formal training before that because we weren't there. There wasn't there was no substance. We weren't getting anything. We weren't getting cop stuff. We weren't giving cop one on one stuff. We weren't getting. Uh, awareness stuff, um, how to be more aware, not only at work, but you got to apply it to your everyday life. You know, these things that you could lose use in your everyday life. So when I was given the op opportunity, I jumped in with everything I had. Uh, I was even staying awake late at night trying to, you know, find better ways. And I would constantly change the, the classes and, and, you know, like all things in our job, and I don't know how other state or other correctional um, programs are like, but Everything is temporary. All of our jobs are temporary in that job. You're only in a position just for a minute before you go to the next one, before you go to the next one, because everybody rotates. And, you know, being in a job like the training manager was was something that most lieutenants would want because weekends and holidays off, it's a preferred job. It's, it's you're not really, in, you're not inside the institution. You have some flexibility on your hours and you get the pride of seeing the fruits of your labor. You get to see it right in front of you. You get to actually make a difference and do something positive. And that's not, that's not something that we always get. So it's a job that was, that was um, viewed as being very favorable. So uh, it was, to look at it in a positive light, it was time for me to rotate out and the next person to rotate in. And the way it happened, um, I may I didn't appreciate because it was a reminder to me that 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 sometimes we can feel replaceable in that job that that no matter what you put into a job you're going to rotate out and somebody else is going to rotate in and you know not that that's necessarily a negative but but um, that's just the nature of that job and that is the difficulty of that job as a correctional officer that is the difficulty is that we are often a number or it feels like we're a number because we're just one more correctional officer because there's no you're not you're not treated like an individual sometimes you're just the next person that's filling that spot for the next person and then the next person and then the next person and I think most of us have felt that way a time or two in our career 
And at that time it was a, it definitely felt like that because the way I was pulled out of the job or the way, it, just the way it happened, I, there was the, the thanks and the, the appreciation, not that I asked for it, but the officers and my peers, many of them were um, very supportive and, hey, thanks, you did a great job. I, mean, I missed your classes or I like, but most of the administrators, I'll say, all of the administrators are like, you know, next, next. Yeah. And, and that's the nature, of the nature of the business, and I understand that. But when the boss pulls you in to say, hey, we're going to pull you out because somebody complained that you've been in that job. And it's, it should be someone else's turn because it's, it's a favorable position. And I'm thinking, you know, all right, but there's no like, hey, not even a, hey, but you know, you did a good job in there. There was a, somebody complained, so we got to pull you out. Hope you understand. And I'm like, okay, well, that, how could that not sting? If you're human at all, yeah, and you've given everything you have to somebody and somebody goes, eh, we're putting someone else in. Well, that's the thing is that's their, things. their administration doesn't feel the same investment that we feel no. when we're when we're doing something, and we feel we're, we're we feel we're doing good at it, and uh, and we're making a difference, you know. And then you know, to them, it's it's just a, it's on a piece of paper in right. somebody's office. And I totally understand it. They're they're not they're not in a position to worry about how I feel about it. I mean, business goes on; it's a yes. business. But there is, you you still need to balance leadership with business, leadership with management. And I can tell you, it doesn't hurt to to think about how you talk, how you treat people, because all of us have felt that way in our career. Every, just about every friend, you know. The thing about this book, the the biggest feedback I get, and I get a lot of it. People send me texts, they send me stuff on Facebook, they call me. The biggest feed, the single biggest feedback I get with that book is people say, "Man, I didn't." For one, they say, "I didn't realize we have so much in common," you know. But the other thing is. How many people felt that way in their career that, that, um, that sometimes we feel like we're just replaceable. And, uh, that's why that's another reason I want to write the book, because to me, you will feel that way in your jobs at times, but it still doesn't mean you don't fight to do the right thing. And it also is a reminder that you get to choose how you treat other people, because if you feel that way from your administration or your supervisor or ever felt that way again, you can either choose to do the same thing to somebody else, or you can take 30 seconds of your time to talk to them like humans, to let them know that there is empathy, not sympathy, but I know how it is to be in issues. That's why I love being the commander of our SWAT team when I became, is because I get to show those guys, I know what it's like to be in your, your shoes. I know you're frustrated with this or, or in their job where they didn't get a promotion. They didn't get the job. My, I felt, I saw it was my job. To help to say, I know how that feels because I was in your shoes. Exactly. But you know what? The sun will rise tomorrow and yes. you will have another opportunity. And if you just treat people with some, an element of kindness, sometimes it makes that, uh, it, it makes a huge difference. And so I learned that even from that situation of being pulled out of the job and the way it just kind of felt cold and like, yeah, next. That, I, don't know, I mean, who am I? We all feel that way in our job. And that's another reason I wanted to write the book. That was, a, that was a very important part of my story to me was that we all feel like that at some point, but you still have to fight to do the right thing. And you have to realize, to me, it's more important how you treat people. You know, how you treat people that work for you and um, with you, you know? Yeah, and that's a, I think that's a, you know, a lesson that while we can all take it to heart, I think that sometimes that's a huge missing element from the administrative level. Big time. You know, I'm, I, and don't, don't get me wrong. I've seen lots of administrators that are, that are very good at that, very good at handling their, their people and stuff. Right. But, um, but there tends to be sort of a institutional view as to, well, I don't have to worry about dealing with that because I'm an, I'm, a, I'm an administrator and, right. and that can, and that can be very, very callous. And that's not part of maybe what management should be doing. When, when you hear that term management, when you're, when you're managing people, you know, sometimes you, sometimes you have to play to what their needs are in some way as not, not all the time, right. but sometimes you don't, sometimes you don't see it at all. Sometimes you go for years without seeing it. You know? Right. And, and, and I've had, you know, I, I've had managers and, and I remember one in particular to say to me, 
you, you don't see it from my perspective because I see the big picture. You don't see the big picture. I see the big picture. And I'm thinking, okay, that's got to work both ways. You know, yeah. it's, and it also helps if it helps. Is it, is it mandatory or necessary? I don't know, but it helps you when you know that administrator has been in your shoes. Yeah. You know, and there is something to that. That's the thing I loved about the army or in the military was I knew those guys had to do exactly what I was doing at one point. And that's what I also love about the, the CRT and the CERT program is you don't just come in as the commander. You don't just take over as a squad leader. You have to, you have to put in your app. You have to find the commander and give your application show up on tryouts, you know, everybody had to do that. So when you're asking people to do something, you're not asking them to do something you, you hadn't done. Now, is that necessary in management to, to have done what they've done? No, but I think it's necessary to... Yeah, but see, see that that element though, the, you know, with, with SWAT and all that, there's a lot more of a meritocracy there. Right. Whereas, um, whereas with the rest of it, it's, it's more of a, that's just another piece of tread on the tire. Right. And, and as we know, um, sometimes you get a promotion, you get these things because of merit or because you, you, you deserve it and you've worked hard and you're intelligent, you get, you know, good interview. But we also know, and, and I hope it doesn't sound callous, but the reality is, and anybody that's a correctional officer would nod their head up and down at this, a lot of positions sometimes are given because of somebody they know or they're friends with and, and, um, or that somebody likes them. And I realize that is part of life, but, uh. But that was one thing nice about this. The the that's what I loved about the CRT program was was you probably were not going to be put in a position unless you you know you sh you show that you could do it. Yeah. You should be the guy that should be pulling the trigger. Right. Uh, nobody you know. nobody could shoot your target for you. Exactly. Nobody could you know nobody could wear all that stuff for you. But you know going back to the to the management versus leadership thing, it, I don't blame. Any of the, it, people that I, I'll, I'll be honest, there are people I thought were very poor leaders. And there's some that I thought were very poor managers. Uh, there were some that were excellent leaders and excellent managers. And I, sometimes it was their fault. And sometimes you don't know what you don't know. You know, yeah. some of them don't know what they, they may have been. They may have had an education and they may have been, they, they may have had an experience being a boss. But some of them showed um, that they, they didn't have the human aspect down because may I don't know, maybe there wasn't time. Maybe there's so much going on, so yeah. many policies, everything's in black and white. we got to follow this, follow this, that sometimes maybe it didn't, there wasn't time for them, I guess, to yeah. think about that. Sometimes a little conversation can go a long way. It can, it can. So, you know, you, you, you've taken all on, on all these things from the, from the academy, to uh, becoming a, a, an operator right. and being an officer, sergeant, lieutenant, um, uh, training, training manager, um, SWAT team commander, and now you're you're almost at the at the end of your professional road. And right. you know, it really, it really struck me in here when you, you talk about uh, pulling out of the institution on on that last day. Um, you know, if you could just relate some of that, because for me, for me, it, it, it was it was so difficult because so so much of my internal personality is wrapped up in in my in my professional self. Right. I don't know how it was for you, but just just talk about that and uh, maybe and maybe give a point or two for some people that are uh, trying to wind it down. And, I, and I'm glad you talk about that because that that was a that was a major motivator and, and something that was very important for me in, in writing that book. I mean, I initially wanted it was initially kind of for my kids. To, to basically tell them you could take a job, even a job that most people think is, is a crazy job to take, like working in a prison. And it's important that um, to not lose your self identity because in, in the process of that. And at, at the end of my career, you know, when I, when I look back, uh, it, it was tough. It was tough to leave because so, I had invested so much of my life there and I had made so many good friends and the thing I would miss most the thing I, that that was hardest to leave was the 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 close friendships that I made and I I was even thankful that some inmates were you know I tried to kind of keep it quiet when I when I left because I don't want parties or I didn't want attention I want I didn't want the the stuff you know the plaque I don't want that I just wanted to 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 just 
go, go away. Right off into the sunset. Yeah, I just wanted to be done. And, um, and so I didn't say much, but as people kind of started finding out, even some of the inmates, they, I would I'd find a letter on my desk and it would be from an inmate. And it would be, and, and a lot of them would say, just thanks for being fair. And I, and I wasn't, you know, I, you would, I, I would say, if I can put some words in your right, mouth, right. is that, I would say, you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect that because um, your version of fairness was more about justice. Yeah. And, um, and it's amazing sometimes to see an inmate understand that it was about justice. Right. But if an inmate was right, I have no problem at exactly. all going to back for him. And, 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 and that's so, justice, though. That's, right. That, you're right. That is justice. And so it was nice that people say that to get even some of the staff that came by to say that I somehow affected them. Um, and one of the, one of them said, you know, I've been in a lot of prisons and there's two people that affected my life. One was this other lieutenant you talked about and for whatever reason, me. And, or, and to know, or, or, or an officer would come in to say, hey, I remember one time I was having a problem with something and so they tell me how I helped them and I totally forgot about that. And when they told me, I kind of even get a little emotional. I was like, you forget, <laughs> you forget the, the people that we touch and we, we, that we come into contact and the friendships we make. Exactly. Exactly. And that because, was tough. You know, sometimes, me. sometimes you're in, sometimes, you know, you're in this profession and you're in a rough spot. Like I was at one point in my career right. and someone will say, Hey, why don't you come on over and uh, work for me in training like you did for me, you right. know? And so, right. I mean, I, I was only there for a little bit, but it was fun. Was but awesome. it was, yeah, it was, yeah. it was an, it was an awesome time. And I love but it. That, that helped me out more than you probably knew at the time because of what I was going through. Right. Well, I remember, yeah, you were, you were going through a tough spell, but, but you had pride in your job and you wanted to make a difference. And you also, you know, kind of what, what I'm talking about here is you did things your way. So even when you taught classes, you put a little, I noticed you put a little spin on it that was your own spin. You weren't trying to be like anybody else or how you thought a class was supposed to be taught or, hey, we got to follow this lesson plan from here. You kind of, you, you, you uh, took it and ran with it. And that, that was, I love that. You know, I, I, I like when anybody does that, but I appreciate it because you had a passion to help cops be better cops. And, um, and that's very necessary. We need, we need more people. Well, I always put that. it that we were all either advocates or ambassadors for the profession. Right. And, and if, if you do that, if you do that, eventually some good will come of it in corrections because it's, it can sometimes be, a, especially when you see it from the point of view that, that I've got of it now where I've interacted with so many people, it can be bleak out there with, with the things that other departments are going. I thought that our department was, was, you know, having a, have a, having a hard time. I went, Wow, right. I'm in the I'm in one of the top two in the nation. Right, you know, you're right. But you know, put a but in there. People still have to push forward and and continue to evolve. You know, like we're talking about going from the special emergency, the the cert, the how that 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 whole process evolved from the old school way to the new school way, where, and they they so much had to be taught that instead of one cert academy, they had to make two academies. Because there's so much information to give, they basically doubled it. They doubled the training to have two courses you had to go through because there's so much to learn. And that's why that program was so successful because it continued to evolve. And it really, politics and things like that didn't slow it down. And like, uh, even though our department might be pretty squared away comparatively, there's gotta be people that push to, um, to continue moving forward you know luckily there's we have those people that's right evolve or die yeah evolve or die and um and um there's always something you can learn from someone else or another state or another officer or, you know there's always something somebody's doing where you say man i like that piece of equipment why are we not using that you know yeah. why can't why can't we look at what you know can't we have a committee or a you know there's there's always a, there's always a way to, to move things forward committee <laughs> yes. Or, and by committee, having different brains, because, be, you know, I saw that on, on our team. I, here, I, at one point, we had over 30, 35 guys on our team, with negotiators. And I was one brain, you know. I didn't know any, I didn't have any answers. In fact, they called me the commander, but I was really just like a coordinator. I was like, okay, here's a problem. What do we have? 
They made decisions. They are like, here's what we need to do. We need to do this. We need to do that. Because it, and, and that makes you successful. That's the thing about sometimes management that we felt frustrated with was our input. We would get something from headquarters sent down that somebody typed up on a desk, put it on a policy, and we're like, where is this coming from? You yeah, know, there's, there's no, the channel goes one way. There's no input going up where, where input should have been, right. Should have been there solving it to begin with. Right. And you, yeah. you worked in ad sec and I mean, oh. you worked at, you know, a lot and you know, and that was after I got out of, uh, IST or the, I went to ad sec and some of those guys were nervous because they're like, Oh, Sharky's coming in here. We're going to be doing training every day. We're going to be talking about hanging. And I didn't do any of that. And they were shocked because I went in there and I was like, I'm not going to tell you guys what to do. You're going to tell me what what you guys need to do. And, and then we'll fine tune you. it. And then yeah. we'll fine tune it. And those, and how many supervisors go into that job or lieutenants who go in there and want to change the world when I learned a valuable lesson then too, that you go in and you, you ask them anytime they'd say, Hey, Chuck, you need to write a policy on, you're going to, we're going to put more phones in there for inmates to use and who's going to, so I would, Pull everybody together. It's so, okay. We got to do. We got to find a way to have phones in here. What What are your? And people will tell you what to do. So I take that piece. Write it down. Oh, that one. Write it down. I didn't think of one thing. I just took what they said. That's what I've always looked at. Is you're gonna. You have a bunch of people out there that are subject matter experts. Right. And it might not be of anything that you can relatively define, but they can tell you about you know who can get you the space you need for something or who can get you a new telephone wire coming in the building right. or who can uh, fix the leaky roof over cell right. number 113. Right. There's somebody that knows that stuff. And how many times have we, have we been told, or how, how, no, you're just, you're gonna do it. Rather than, <laughs> you know, and we're like, that's not gonna work. And how many things have we implemented that just fell by the wayside how many, you know, many of them, it was an idea. Okay. Now we're not doing that anymore. When we probably could have told you that you know, a long time ago that that wasn't yeah. going to work. Exactly. Well, you know, this is, this has been really great. I was, I was so excited for those of you that don't have the book yet. I got mine on my, on my Kindle at home. It's knuckle dragger by Robert Sharkey. And, uh, you know, if, if those of you haven't, who haven't figured out the knuckle dragger part, you know, that's the struggle inside the mind. That's the, that's the part that's the knuckle dragger here. Um, you know, Rob spent all those years, you know, with the, I don't know, with the division between use of force and uh, making his mind the proper weapon most of the time. Sometimes right. it's just all down to the duking it out. And we've been there and, do, and done that too. But anyway, um, I want to thank you for your time. And plug in the book once again, because we're going to be plugging this all week, Knuckle Dragger by Robert Sharkey. This is available at Amazon. You can get it in uh, paperback and on Kindle. Is, right. there a, is there a hardback edition? No. Yes. Yeah. So, it's, so it's just the, just the um, soft cover edition for right now. Anyway, everyone out there, uh, stay safe. And uh, we'll see you around on Keepers of Chaos and Tear Talk. Hope you like this, Anthony. Anthony.